You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Cabral Concept. I'm Stephen Cabral, and today on our Friday review, this is episode number 511. We're going to go over a book review by popular request, and we're going to go over a lot to do with the summer today, like what's a safe amount of actual time in the sun. We're going to go over if you still need to supplement with vitamin D3 or not, and if you're going to use sunscreen, what should you be using? Like, What are the ones without all the chemicals? Because I know that a lot of people are doing a lot of things right in terms of their nutrition. They have water filters. They're doing a lot of great things, but they're still lathering on sunscreen that has known cancer-causing chemicals. And we're trying to prevent skin cancer, but yet we're putting on lotions that can cause cancer. So I'm going to go over those things in just a few moments. But for today, we're going to get started with our book review that's actually by popular request. So this book... I talked about it literally about 300 episodes ago. It was quite uh, a while back, but I didn't do a review on it. It was actually answered in a Cabral house call because I was looking back at my notes. I've got this huge spreadsheet with, um, let's see, 600 and something lines of actual uh, data. And these are all the podcasts that I've obviously done up to 511. But I keep, I I don't use notes for my house calls or for my podcast in general, but I always have all the titles and uh, when they were recorded, and I can see that this was back over a year ago. So the question was, is there any credence to the book Wheat Belly? And is it a good book? Is it something worth reading? So I'm going to give you two parts to this because um, for one, I, w- I do want to let you know that this is an excellent book. So it, let's just say right now your husband or partner or girlfriend or friend or whoever it might be doesn't really think that wheat or gluten is that big of a deal. And they don't think it's connected at all to their autoimmune disease, their inflammation, their skin issues, your children's learning-based issues, uh, ADD, ADHD, anything at all. What I'd like you to do is recommend this book. It's very simple to read. Honestly, this is a very easy book to read. That's why I do like recommend it as well, because it's approachable by someone, even if they've never read a book on health before in their life. That's how it was written. And and that's a good thing, meaning like I'm trying to do my best to make my book like that as well. Uh, This is 200 and it's really only 200 pages. The rest of it's appendix with recipes and things like that. So let me give you the, the pros and cons of this book. The pro is it's absolutely absolutely fantastic. Dr. William Davis does a great job at actually breaking down all of the different symptoms that you may have and how they can actually be directly correlated to wheat, to gluten, to gliadin, and how those actual sensitivities take place in the gut and then end up as headaches or brain fog or fibromyalgia or skin issues, any of these things. And and he does a really good job at that. So again, if you believe that someone that you're close with, friend, loved one, coworker, is dealing with an issue that has to do with the amount of bagels or pasta or bread or cereal or anything that they're eating that's wheat-based, get them a copy of this book. Um, Definitely recommend it. I'll link it up, of course, in the show notes today because there might be multiple um, versions of it. I'll send the one over the one uh, right to Amazon that we would recommend. And uh, let's now let's talk about what I don't love about it, okay? Love the book. Great, great information. What I do not like is the battle he has going on with what seems to be a battle with the China study and Cornell University's Dr. Colin Campbell. So Dr. Campbell did a very large-scale study in China, and it's, I think it's like almost a 900-page book. And essentially, I've read it um, going through and talking about 
really, he's a proponent of a vegan-based diet. We'll just say that. And I've talked about this before on the Cabral concept, okay? He, Dr. Campbell's a proponent of the a vegan-based diet, and Dr. Davis, William Davis, who wrote The Wheat Belly, so The Wheat Belly, hopefully I said this book, na- book's name, is uh, he's a proponent of the paleo diet, and he's a proponent of using dairy. So he tries to poke holes in the China study in saying really the relationship between what Dr. Colin Campbell found in China was actually in relation to wheat and not in relation to dairy. Here's the issue. There are both challenges over which one caused what, but neither one of them are good for you. Meaning like cow's milk. So Dr. William Davis right here, he's recommending cow's milk, but cow's milk has been clinically proven to increase inflammation and clinically proven to increase levels of IGF-1. That's insulin and growth like factor one. So basically what happens is that can increase your body's proliferation of tumors and cancer in the body. Okay. Just because you drink it doesn't mean you're going to get cancer, but certainly it leads to a proliferation or a metastasizing of cancerous tumors. That's been shown. No doubt about it. Like no doubt about it. Cow's milk is also the number one food sensitivity. Okay. So there's that. The other thing is, unless you are buying grass fed grass-fed cow's milk, meaning like it was fed literally grass. That's what it ate. And it was grass finished. And it wasn't just getting, um, or even organic doesn't signify better because they could be feeding the cow corn and soy and other types of grains that it was not meant to consume. So really with the qualify, again, if you're going to do cow's milk, well, what kind of, what kind of food, what kind of diet is that cow drinking? So I don't think we can go with that. All right. That's really my only big drawback about this is that he just kind of shoots down anything about a vegan based diet. And again, for me in particular, I'm not recommending a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, or a paleo based diet or Mediterranean diet or a macro macrobiotic diet. What I'm recommending is the best diet for you. But what's the best diet for every human alive that I've talked about this many, many times? 60 to 80% vegetation, fruits and vegetables. There is no one who refutes that. Legitimately, like if you refute vegetables at being 80% of your diet, 60 to 80% of your diet, then you need a lot more work on your study because there are no diets. Like, yes, you can have a sensitivity to a certain vegetable, no doubt about it, or too much fruit, like meaning the higher glycemic um, fruits. Yes, that's a possibility, but not fruits and vegetables. These are the things that definitely prevent cancer, that help to destroy cancer cells, that keep us living a longer, healthier life, that people in the blue zones, die, blue zones, the long lived population ate. There is no one who's going to say you should be eating a high wheat diet or a high dairy diet. There, that is not a health recommendation. So again, read this book called The Wheat Belly. And again, I apologize if I didn't start my podcast off with what the name of this book is, Wheat Belly by William Davis. And what I'd like to say is this, the whole beef with the China study doesn't start until page 160. That means you can really get 150 pages or so of just really good information on why you won't want to make wheat, especially the new hybridized wheat, which he talks about in the book, not the ancient grains from a thousand years ago. Really, I mean, they're totally different. Uh, and, and why that may be affecting your uh, immune system, your nervous system, your skin, your headaches, your fibromyalgia. So check it out. Um, if you'd like, good book. And I, it definitely gets a recommendation from for me, just keep in mind his, in my opinion, and again, I'm not taking any shots. I think um, William Davis is fantastic, um, absolutely uh, knows his stuff, but not. But recommending a high-fat diet for every human alive is not a great thing. Recommending dairy for any human alive, saying they can have it as much quantity as they want for cheese, not a great thing because you're also not qualifying it. And I don't think we can use unlimited amounts of oil uh, and meat and eggs in our diet, not for every person alive, especially since 26% of the population um, specifically reduce uh, or I should say um, react with higher amounts of inflammation in their body when they eat a high fat diet. And you can look that up. That is the APOE um, allele number four, and you can have a three, four or four, four, and that's clinically proven. So we're going to have to be careful whenever we say an all or one. All right. I know it's not easy, but we still have to, we still have to at least try our best as practitioners. All right. Up next is, should you be taking vitamin D during the summer? This was a really popular question as well. So whenever I get it multiple times, instead of me doing it on the house call, a lot of times I just like to add it to my Friday reviews where it might be research. It might be stuff that I'm using myself. Vitamin D is something that you should keep up with during the summer. Here's why. Unless you're literally outside 
getting mostly a full body tan for four days or more per week, you're most likely going to need some vitamin D. And let me tell you about that. So here's why. If you are wearing a pair of pants and you're wearing a short sleeve shirt and you walk outside, you're only getting your forearms tanned and your face tanned. That's not enough to raise your vitamin D levels. Uh, You need to raise by, you should literally be in a bathing suit and getting your sun, and I'll talk about safe sun time next, in order to get your vitamin D levels high enough, okay? That's really, really important because people say, oh, I'm getting sun. But if you look, they have what we call a farmer's tan, right? They have the tan from the sleeves down, and they have a tan from their neck uh, all the way up on their face, and that's about it. So again, not enough to raise vitamin D. How do I know that? About five years ago, I started testing people all the time for vitamin D, and here's what I found. Only about three out of 100 people that I tested had adequate levels of vitamin D even in the summer, which is amazing. And here's why. People are going away to a summer house or a cottage or they're getting outside on the weekends, but they're not getting enough sun Monday through Friday. So just keep in mind, two days a week is not enough sun to raise your vitamin D levels, okay, even during the summertime. So Unless you have the majority of your body tanned and you're getting tan at least, like I said, three, four days a week, um, you're most likely your vitamin D levels are low, especially if you came into the summer with levels in the, let's say, 30s. You need to bump that up. Ideally, your levels are between 50 and 70. That's what you want to look for on your lab work. So again, 32 means you're not too low in vitamin D, but really from a functional standpoint, from an optimal standpoint, you have to get that up between 50 and 70. So you can simply take a vitamin D test right at home. It's literally a drop of blood. Like you literally do a little finger poke, finger stick, and you put a drop of blood on a card. It's that simple. We'll link it up in the show notes if you choose to do it. Uh, again, just go to steamcabral.com forward slash 511 to do your own vitamin D test this summer to look inside your own uh, physiology to see what your number is. And so what would I recommend? Okay, if you're not going to do the customized vitamin D profile, meaning like do a vitamin D test for under $100, um, you can just simply take 1,000 to 2,000 IUs of vitamin D if you have not had your levels taken. So you want to look for a vitamin D3. You can do it as a liquid or you can do it as a capsule. It's very, very simple. They're tiny capsules. And um, if you weigh over 150, 160 pounds, you might want to go with the D2,000. And if you weigh under that, you might want to go with the 1,000. This is for adults we're talking about. And then you can get your vitamin D levels checked again in the fall if you would like and just check that dosage knowing that the sun will become less strong at that time. So let's just say you do test during the summer and your levels in the 30s. Well, you'll probably want to use your 5,000 IUs even during the summer to get your levels back up between 5,000 uh, between 5,000, between 50 and 70. So that is uh, my vitamin D recommendation. Great companies are Thorn for vitamin D, uh, vitamin D3, orthomolecular for vitamin D3. Uh, who else is good? Uh, well, we use both those. So th- those are great ones to use. And safe sun time. Well, there's all these crazy recommendations out there saying like, oh, 15 minutes is the max you should get. No, really, it should be like 12 and a half minutes. To give these recommendations as blanket statements is um, just ludicrous. And here's why. If you have someone who has very fair skin, basically, let's just say their heritage is from uh, Norway or just lighter skinned population, how much sun do they need? Well, it's going to be very different than someone from African descent or someone even from um, Sicilian descent. It, It doesn't make any sense. They need different levels of sun exposure. Their bodies are expecting different levels of sun exposure. And not only that, they can't get enough vitamin D, uh, let's say someone from African descent, darker skin, unless they get hours. Like it literally might be four to five hours of sun exposure. And that's radically different from what you're hearing right now. And that's because you're saying you're hearing, oh, 15 minutes is the, oh, the max amount of sun you should get. No, it's not true. We all have different shades of skin color. We all have different amounts of melanin in our skin. And the less melanin we have, the more vitamin D we can get into our body, into our skin. And the reason is we would have gotten less a, like possible availability to get that. So our skin was lighter. And then skin being darker, we're out in the sun more. So now it can withstand more of it. So, but we need more. That's natural for us. Okay? So here's the thing. How much should you get? Well, once you're in the sun and your skin starts to turn a slight hue of pink, 
not red. I'm not talking about getting a sunburn. A, a, you can see your skin heat up, that slight hue of pink. You know you've gotten enough sun. Now it's time to cover up. That's the best thing you can do. The second best thing you can do is put on a natural sunscreen if you're out, on, outside. So we're going to talk about that next. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, literally, so myself, I have, I'm have i literally like a dozen different nationalities. I, I don't even have a nationality. But I probably just associate most with uh, Portuguese, being Portuguese and Italian. And that's simply because... Uh, my parents' two names, basically, one's Italian and one's Portuguese. So it's just easier to identify with that, I guess. And that's a lot of our traditions, but literally a dozen different nationalities. I can be in the sun without sunscreen. I don't get burnt. Literally, the first time of the year, if I haven't been naturally, gradually getting a little bit more sun, then if I were, or if I were to go on vacation, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to put on sunscreen for sure, because then I could get burnt. But really, my skin does not get burnt, which means that I don't need sunscreen. Sunscreen is to prevent the burning. That's what it's for. If you get a tan, that's normal. That's natural. That's okay. Burning is bad. Burning is what causes the skin-based mutations. So that's very, very important. The only reason why some people wouldn't want to get a tan is because, yes, in the future, it could lead to some uh, degradation of the skin. It could lead to some wrinkling and things like that. And that's that's obviously personal preference. Um, so what can we talk about, though, in terms of safe sunscreen? You're out of the beach. Um, you know you're going to be getting lots of sun that day. Okay, let's put that sunscreen on, but let's make sure that it isn't full of chemicals. There are chemicals right now. And again, this is all coming out of my new book. Parabens, phthalates, uh, polyethylene glycols, uh, propylene glycols, SLSs, which is just like sulfates, um, things like oxybenzone, uh, really, really important that we see these things. And they're not always even listed on the ingredients. These are known carcinogens. That means they're known to cause cancer. Legitimately, the products that are trying to prevent can- uh, skin cancer can cause cancer. I know it's wild, but it's true. And they're also endocrine disruptors, which means they affect the nervous system. How do they do this? Your skin is porous. You literally put this on your skin. It gets absorbed through your skin and it goes directly into your bloodstream, like right into your bloodstream. Doesn't even have to pass through the liver. That is why these things can cause cancer. And, and again, I know you say, well, how can that be? These things are prescribed. They're not. They're not prescribed and they're not regulated. And most likely you're dermatologist has no idea what these products are. They didn't go to school to learn about parabens and these types of things. Like, no idea. They have absolutely no idea. They just know that it's possible to get cancer from the sun, so we might as well put sunscreen on. But at the same time, you need to get a tan because you need to get your vitamin D levels up. If you don't get a tan, you're almost guaranteed your vitamin D levels are low. So what do we do? Well, we try to do things naturally. So we can use a product called a zinc oxide. Okay, zinc oxide, we just want to make sure that it's called non-nanoparticles. So nanoparticles, think of them as tiny, tiny particles that could actually seep through the skin. Okay, it's not proven yet, but we still don't want to make sure that they seep through the skin. So we just look for micronized zinc or we look for non-nano zinc oxide. And then you can find pretty much any brand that you would like, but I have some great brands for you. And these are ones that I use in my own family. So why not recommend them to you? So Um, All of these things, again, you can actually look. There's a website that we use all the time, and it's just called the EWG, okay? The EWG goes, it's their job. Like literally, they're an unbiased, um, they're a nonprofit that goes through cosmetics, they go through sunscreens, they go through shampoos and conditioners, and they rate the toxicity levels. It's amazing. So one of the ones that always comes up on top is is a company called Badger. Again, I have no affiliation with these companies uh, except that they're the best products and I always recommend the best for you. And I'm going to use them and do use them with my family. So I like Badger. It's a great company. It's non-nano uncoated zinc oxide. It's the best of the best. And it comes in different variations, anywhere from 25 SPF all the way up to, I believe, like 40 or higher SPF. So great product. We use it with our kids. I've used it myself, especially on the back of my neck, because the back of my neck, if I'm just sitting out there in the sun baking, it will start to get way too dark and and get sunburned as well. 
And then um, some people don't love the company because it can leave a little bit of a white hue. But the reason it's leaving a white hue is that it's a block and these things are not being absorbed into the skin. That's the whole point is that we're not allowing them to, to sink into the skin. But there is a company that I just found out about and we'll be using them this summer because there are no um, added ingredients that are unnatural. And it is called Loving Naturals Clear Sunscreens. So Loving Naturals is also a zinc based product, but theirs goes on clean uh, with no white residue, as they say. So I'll tell you, and one of the reasons is they add coconut oil and they add uh, cocoa butter. So that's a great thing. And the reason is that it makes it a little smoother to go on. It rubs in a little bit better. One of my colleagues who's a a really smart nutritionist, his wife actually created their own using the zinc oxide with shea butter and with coconut oil. He said he would share with me and all of our community the recipe that she used because um, although I didn't wear it myself just because, again, I didn't need it, uh, a bunch of people that I was on a trip with put it on and it went on clear and they didn't get red or anything like that. So I've seen it work and I'm going to pass that on to you. But of course, for now, instead of making your own, you can simply get the Badger brand or the Loving Naturals Claire sunscreen brand. I will link both of those up in the show notes today. So just go to stevencabral.com forward slash 511. I hope you enjoyed all of the product book reviews today. And of course, be sure to tune back in tomorrow and Sunday for our Cabral house calls, where I answer all of our community's questions each and every week on everything wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another great week of the Cabral concept. I appreciate each and every one of your listens. Before you go, I wanted to ask you this question. What if I could teach you in just a couple of hours how to transform your thyroid, hormones, adrenal, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, weight loss, energy, mood, brain, pregnancy, anti-aging, or many other health-related issues? After 20 years in private practice, after seeing and overseeing a quarter of a million client appointments, I sincerely feel I have the real-world data and have found the answer you've been searching for. So what I've done is spent hundreds of hours of my own time refining what you need to know in order to uncover your underlying root cause health issues and then begin to rebalance the body and bring it back to a state of robust health and wellness. I'm going to teach you exactly what I do in my private practice so you can understand how you got here and now what you need to do in order to heal. You'll receive all of the important success checklists, protocols, and even ways to customize it to make the program fit your busy life. And you'll get all of this at a fraction of the price. Let me save you the time, money, energy, stress, and frustration of not knowing what to do next. Instead of reading dozens of books on the topic and seeing multiple practitioners, I will condense everything that you need to know in just a few hours of video tutorials that you can watch and listen to anywhere. Together, we will make this healing process an enjoyable one that you can take with you for the rest of your life. I wish you all of the best of health and happiness, and I hope to be able to guide you on your healing journey through my Health Results Accelerators. Simply choose the health imbalance you're currently suffering from, and by the end of today, you'll know what went wrong and how to get well again. I guarantee it. For details, head over now to stephencabral.com forward slash courses. 